Well, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video, all math based of course, and as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you here today as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. Step on inside as we decide to do some graphing with absolute value functions. The next few videos that you'll see that are related to my integrated math 2 class is going to regard absolute values. This time graphing absolute value functions, next time solving absolute value functions, both algebraically and graphically, and then graphing and solving absolute value inequalities. So everything within there. Now there are some things that you're going to have to have known before, such as domain and range and things like that. So if you come on, step on the side, guys, we're going to do 11 practice problems. And really, after you get the gist of what a few of them kind of encompass regarding the general formula, how you pick it apart and what you do, this thing's going to be a breeze, not just even as far as what you can do, but just even time-wise on this video. So let's go ahead and get straight into it, guys. Um, for absolute value functions, you know, we're talking about these symbols right here, right here, okay? Um, there's something very specific about absolute values is that the absolute value of something is the distance from zero. And basically, um, direction is, er, excuse me, regardless of direction whether you're going to the right or to the left, whatever distance from zero is all that matters. A lot of people say you make terms positive, and there's something with that. The absolute value of a negative number becomes its positive result, just like the absolute value of a positive number because it's, uh, becomes its positive result. But um, as far as just making sense of, I don't know, I think I just wanna give you the technique of it. Hopefully you've heard a little bit about it, or you can always use a table and try some things. Just understand when you take something like the absolute value of negative three, you get three, and when you take the absolute value of three, you get three. So little things like that. Oh, there's one other thing that I just wanna mention in general before I get into the actual form itself, that when you have the absolute value of a product or really a, a fraction, you can also split those things up. That's gonna come into play and take the uh, product of the absolute value of both of them. That's gonna come into play in some of the problems that I do and use to get it into its proper form. Okay, so what are all these problems going to look like here? Well, you know slope-intercept form y equals mx plus b? That m and that b mean something on the graph. Well, we can do the same thing because there's a general form as well, or it's called standard form, I guess, for graphing absolute value functions, in which you can kind of play in the same way. And it goes like this. If you have an absolute value function that looks like a times the absolute value of x minus h, and then plus k, all of these values can mean something for your graph. And this is not the last time you are going to see the letters A, H, and K, meaning what they do here on other graphs, such as quadratic functions. I don't think we get into cubic functions for integrated math too, but you'll see me do it for my um, uh, rational functions and cubic functions and exponential functions and things like that in integrated math three material. So you'll see these things. Now the H and the K represent your vertex. The vertex is at h comma k. The vertex is the absolute maximum or absolute minimum of every absolute value function graph. If you have, and your graphs are gonna have a V shape to them, if your absolute value function graph is right side up like this, a right side up V, your vertex is down there at an absolute minimum at the coordinate pair h comma k. If you have an upside down absolute value graph that's a V shape like this, that's an absolute maximum that also occurs at the point H comma K. The, the point is it's the vertex. That's what the vertex is. That's where it exists. A represents what's called a stretch factor. It represents what's called a stretch factor. Stretch factor in this case for absolute value functions is almost treated the same way as a slope. Some rise over some run. Whatever that value is written as a fraction or otherwise can be represented as a slope. The difference is because your graph is V-shaped instead of straight and goes through all the way, that at some point it takes that bend and it kind of slopes off the other direction. So as long as you know a little bit about slope, then this should make some sense. But at some point, you might want to be, start calling it a stretch factor, especially if I ever get into quadratics because quadratics don't have a constant slope. All right, so what does all of this mean right here? We have an equation, guys. Let's let's look at number one. Now I'm gonna kind of ignore what this stuff says unless it asks me for more information. It says predict what it's gonna look like and verify using so graphing calculator. You'll verify from my graphs here <laughs> if that's okay. And um, I'll give my prediction, you know, without use of a table and kind of let you know how all this plays out. So here's what we got, guys. G of x equals six times the absolute value of x minus three. Now when it looks when we're trying to get it in the standard form, we're trying to pick apart what this standard form tells us about the graph, then we can understand its features and graph with it. 6 is like the a value, right? Looks like we have a equals 6. 
the h value now this thing's really you got to be careful with this one here because this says x minus h and this says x minus three because a minus is in the formula and i'm not going to get into y today but because the minus is in the formula right here that means the h value is actually three <laughs> excuse me and then the k value you know i don't see a number there but that does mean that it's like plus zero. So if plus k is plus zero, then that must mean that k equals zero. So we have all of the numbers here that can help us pull apart what we're going to do in this graph. What this means is that the stretch factor here, or the slope, if you will, as we treat slope, is six, or better yet, six over one, rise six, run one, you know? And then the vertex occurs at the point three comma zero. So here's how I'm gonna graph this. It's a pretty straightforward process. And although these don't have scales, just assume all these go by ones, okay? I'm gonna start at the vertex at three comma zero. One, two, three, like that. This is the part where my graph will end up having that V shape, where it will boop, go like that. Or in some cases, like this. Now my graph, how do I know whether my graph's right side up or upside down? It's based on whether the A value is positive or negative. If the A value is positive, it's an upward facing graph. If the A value is negative, it's a downward facing graph. And that's it. That's it. This one is a positive A value, therefore it will be an upward facing graph. So you see the six over one here? I'm going to rise six and run one. And you might say in which direction? Well, that's the thing of the absolute value graphs. It doesn't matter direction. We run right and we run left. We rise six, one, two, three, four, five, six, we run one, so it can look like a positive graph, but we also do the same thing to the left side. One, two, three, four, five, six, and run one to the left. Because this graph does face upward based on the A value being that, but then the nature of the absolute value portion says that X goes either direction while A goes up. So we go up that way and up that way. Now I don't really have enough points to fit the other ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that, and over one, but it's something like that. The point being, this is going to be a V-shaped graph that has a vertex at 3, 0. And when I connect the dots and, you know, I, I draw this line here, it's going to be looking like going like this here. And it bounces off the vertex and then it goes in this direction here. And that is the appearance of this graph. It has the vertex. It is straight lines. These are not curves. These are straight lines on these things, like a constant slope up 6 over 1, both directions. And unlike a, a natural, you know, linear equation that would just go like this straight through, this thing does have that bounce off nature to it. And that's what we're going to do for all these guys. We're going to pull apart our A, H, and K values. So at some point, I'll kind of do them mentally. And then, you know, we're good from there. But you have to first make sure that you are in that standard form, just like slope intercept form. If you're not in Y equals MX plus B form, then you can't call that your b and your m you know you can't do those things unless you're in that form and that's why sometimes i think we have to get in it first and then we'll be set all right that's one problem let's keep going with this thing and let's see if it keeps making sense here number two uh g of x equals negative four times x plus two or the absolute value of x plus two and then plus five okay the stretch factor the a value is negative four now, you have to be careful here because this time it is a negative value and it does matter because it's not inside the absolute value and this will flip the graph over, you know, your stretch factor is negative four over one, right? So it's a down four as we go over one. We'll pay attention to that. And now H and K for our vertex values. Let's see, the K value, as we look at the formula here, says plus K while well, we're looking at here a plus five. So this is plus five and plus K, that means K is five. The H is a little tricky because the H value in the formula says what? Minus H, X minus H. What does this say? This is X plus two. Well, that's the same thing as X minus negative two. Not that I'm gonna write this each time, but how can a formula say minus and then our equation say plus and just say, oh yeah, you know, it's just two. It's not just two. It's a negative two. That's what's being subtracted to make it look like a plus. Basically, you take the opposite. I've heard other teachers say, flip, keep, or whatever. You know, flip flip the sign, keep the sign. Whatever, flip, keep, flip, keep. So the H is a negative two. We are going to go two to the left when we plot that vertex. And yeah, let's pull out that information. So the stretch factor is negative four over one, and the vertex is at negative two comma five like that. So we know where our vertex is gonna be. Remember, we keep the sign for the positive five. Let's go left two and up one, two, three, four, five. This is where our vertex is. This is either going to be a graph that looks like this or a graph that looks like this. 
Now, based on the A value being negative, it will be upside down. This point is an absolute maximum, and we are going to go down four as we go over one in both directions. So this time I will go down one, two, three, four, and right one, down one, two, three, four, and right one, and we continue. As many points as you can fit. That's my mantra. Fit plot as many points as you can fit. Same thing on the left side. Down four and left one. Down four and left one. Down four and left one. Now the book is not paying to mind. Sorry, I want to say the book. I mean this problem. The problem set you're looking at is from a textbook or workbook. This book is not paying to mind something that is called the axis of symmetry. Um, something that all absolute value functions should be containing. If you notice that we're going down the same amount and over the same amount in both directions, which means this graph holds that symmetry that if I drew a vertical line right down the middle of this thing here, that you have basically a mirror image on both sides. And this is something that, you know, if they do ask me about it, I'll talk about it more, but they might ask about what is the axis of symmetry, and it's basically the equation of that line, in this case, x equals, what, negative two, just showing that, hey, there is symmetry on this thing, and you'll see me start plotting points based on the nature of the symmetry. I'll do it on the next problem if you'd like, and here's what I mean. See how this is one away, this is one away. See how this is two away, this is two away. Items of the same height are equidistant from the axis of symmetry, which is kind of a cool, neat feature. Parabolas do the same thing, and I bet that this book and everything else, myself included, will be talking more about this when it comes to parabolas. I, I think it's just as important there. Anyway, so that is the graph, and make sure you do the draw, uh, draw the arrows because this thing would go down forever when you have that graph there. All right, let's continue forward. Number three, g of x equals the absolute value of 7 fifths times the quantity x minus 6 plus 4. Now, if you want this thing to appear in true blue, you know, vertex form of, a, of an absolute value function here, you might recall that the a value sits outside of here where you have a, whoopsie, where you have a positive 1x right there and then minus h plus k. So, you know, what you have here is a product. You have 7 fifths multiplied by this x minus 6. And if you saw what I said, uh, mentioned before here, if you have the absolute value of a product, you can split that into the product of two absolute values like this. This is nice because you want to make sure, you want to ensure that the A value is truly what it is and that the vertex is truly what it is, everything like that. So this is 7 fifths times this thing all in one absolute value. Well, I'm going to split that up into absolute value of 7 fifths times the absolute value of x minus 6, like that that product is now split up into its own separate absolute values. And the absolute value of 7 fifths is 7 fifths. See, x minus 6, with x being a variable in that quantity, I can't do anything to this one other than, you know, graph its representation. But 7 fifths is a single number, not treated with a variable. I can take its absolute value just fine, and now it appears like I want it to here, exactly in that vertex form. This is the equivalent of what I'm looking for to make it look like that. Right, these are now interchangeable. I can now recognize what is A, what is H, and what is K. So what is A, H, and K? A is 7 fifths. I'm not gonna write stretch factor this time, but that's what A is. And my vertex occurs at HK, H being six, remember subtracting six there, and then K being plus four, plus four, so four. So we're gonna start at six comma four, and then we have our stretch factor to go. And um, I don't know, as, as I'm looking at this thing, we're not gonna be able to fit very many points going upward, but I'll just, I'll kind of work with it. Um, it's one of those things where I wish my scale was a little different, but because it's a, uh, I don't know, I, I'll deal with it. Um, so over, over six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and up one, two, three, four, is going to be our vertex. Because A is a positive value, it will be an upward facing graph. This is the absolute minimum right here. And don't be too scared about this thing being a fraction. In fact, embrace it. This is kind of e the easiest way to really draw these things by talking about how much you rise and how much you run. And we're going to rise seven and we'll run in both directions five. If you consider that axis of symmetry thing I was just talking about the other time, Right, this splits right down the middle. So although I go up one, two, three, four, five, six, eh, off the grid seven, I can go right one, two, three, four, and off the grid five, the best I can there, and to the left side, one, two, three, four, five. As long as I'm up seven, I go right and left the same amount. Looks like I might not have gotten any, eh, just enough. There we go. And then, uh, you know, and then that's my graph. So like I said, this grid 
you know, it's a little out of scale there. Just plot what I can and draw that graph and I'm good to go, guys. I am set and finished. And I guaranteed what I need to by pulling it out. You might say, hey, that was all you gotta do is just pull that thing out of the absolute value. For the most part, yeah. Just, you know, make sure you turn it positive if it wasn't already. And I think we'll run into one that, you know, isn't positive to begin with, but we'll see. Just like this one right here, this three sevenths, as long as there's nothing else in front of the X, guys, you can split that three sevenths off, essentially pull it out and multiply by it. So, you know, this is the equivalent to three sevenths times the quantity X minus four, and then close that and then plus two. So, you know, same thing, just get it in its form for, you know, comfort, making sure you're doing, you know, make sure you're safe with it. Um, because you don't want to mess up if it's if it's not you know right with that. So uh, once again, the a value guys is three sevenths rise three run seven in either direction, and it is a rise because the number is positive. And then your vertex is at four comma two. Once again, one of those flip, keep flip the sign, keep the sign, four comma two. Hopefully you're already getting used to this. You know, one two three four one two. There's my vertex. We are going to rise three, run seven in both directions, but first let's rise three, one, two, three, and then go one, two, three, four, five, six, off the grid, seven, I hope that's all right. And then back to my axis of symmetry right here, I didn't draw the line, but let's go seven this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I can actually fit another point if you don't mind here. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This isn't asymmetrical, I just couldn't fit more on the left side. I hope you're okay with understanding that although this V-shape looks like it's longer in one direction, the arrows are telling you otherwise, it goes forever in both directions. I just, my rule for myself is plot as many points as you can fit or plot what's necessary. I needed at least one set here. I really did need this set right here. And I still have my symmetry afloat. Okay, I hope that this is feeling okay, guys. This is one of those things where hopefully you got exposed to it a little bit or what I'm saying kind of makes sense with it as we continue through a couple of these because I still have, what, seven more problems to go and they don't change very much. They're all going to be kind of samey. You're asked to graph and I don't know what they'll try and trick you with next, but you know, here you go. For example, they have parentheses around here that are really unnecessary. Um, I'll just, you know, rewrite it without them just to, once again, get in that format of what is H, what is K, you know, all that x minus 2 minus 3. So the parentheses were just decoys, they're not needed. The a value is 7 fourths, the vertex is 2 comma negative 3, the first vertex that is underneath the x-axis. Yay, we got one. But again, flip, keep, minus 3. It's a plus k means plus negative 3. For this to be minus, that means the k must be a negative. Right two, down three, this is the vertex. Our A value is positive. I will rise seven, run four, both directions. Up seven over four. I get pretty, this is from negative three, so plus seven is four. And then left four this way, boom. Couldn't really fit another point because it goes off the grid, but you know, just, just kind of get it near. Uh, where's four? I guess that's four right there. Kind of give myself the right idea of where it's gonna be just for Precision. Well, maybe it wasn't perfect anyway. Either way, either way is fine. I guess I wasn't perfect. I'm not going up enough, or so it seems. All right, there is the graph of that one. There it is, guys. Your axis of symmetry would go right through here. It shows the mirror image of those. And that's all that's on this first page here. I got six more to go, and I think the instructions might change, so we'll see. Remember, these ones said, like, predict what it will look like, and then looking at a graphing calculator. I am your graphing calculator, guys. We did make our predictions upward facing in this, this translation. We translate a certain amount of units this way and that way and things like that. I should be using the word translate, not shift. All right, let's move forward here. Graph the function and identify, here we go, the domain and range, domain and range. How far left and right, how far left and right do these graphs go? How far up and down do these graphs go? I'm gonna give you a little secret. Unless there's something that changes on these graphs from the first five equations I saw and all these five equations that I'm seeing here, your domain should be all real numbers. There shouldn't be any sort of restriction on domain for these things. My only question is where am I gonna write them? I filled these up. These graphs are not the ones from the book, so I filled these up a little bigger than normal. Um, I don't know where I can really put them. I'll try and just fit them on the side or something or right above. But domain, I'll let you know right now, guys, these graphs should go left and right forever. The question is gonna be on the range. What is the ceiling, what is the floor? right? Because there's an absolute min or max because of the vertex, but the domain, it goes left and right forever, which is nice. 
All right, g of x equals the absolute value of x. Now, don't be too fooled with this one. If you did want to write this in that vertex form, uh, it would look like this. The a value would be a 1, right? If you don't see a number multiplied in front, that means it's a 1. x isn't subtracting anything with it. Does that make that a 1? No, it makes it a 0, minus 0. And nothing's added outside of it. We've seen that before. That's like a plus 0. So if you wanted your vertex form equivalent with this thing, you can still write it. I don't know how necessary it is, although you do have to call some things out, such as the a value. We need to mention the slope that it has, but there is no horizontal shift. There's no vertical shift on this thing. This vertex is actually right at the origin. We are going to start right there. This is called the parent function of this graph, actually, by the way. It's the most basic form without any sort of manipulation tied, uh, tied to it. The a, the stretch factor is one, or one over one. Rise one, run one. So. I get to do that. Rise one, run one. Boom, boom, boom. And this would just keep going in this direction here. And remember, that's a vertex that we're talking about there. So this is also, um, it bounces off and it rises one and runs one to the left as well. And there we go. Off to the races. All right. Let's go ahead and draw that graph. Now, they are also asking for the domain and the range. I'd be happy to provide, to provide the one for you. It goes up and right forever. It goes up and left forever. I guess that means it goes left and right forever. So the domain, as I mentioned before, all real numbers. There we go. Everything left and right forever. The range, on the other hand, there is a limitation. It does. It goes up forever, but it doesn't go down forever. The absolute minimum is on the vertex with a y value of 0. It hits 0, and it hits everything above 0 as it's a continuous function. This is y is greater than or equal to zero that's your domain in your range i'm not in love with my all real number symbol i'm sure i'm not even doing it perfectly anyway but i like to not make it look exactly like a capital r without that other little block there yeah how am i going to fit it here i guess i'll just have to squeeze it in on the sides or we'll just have to you know fit it where there ain't, where there ain't no graph all right this thing's already kind of in its vertex form right here let's try and say these ones out loud without writing extra information where is that vertex where, where does this go? Is it left five, up seven, you, where? This is that flip, keep. Flip the negative five to a positive five as far as saying we translate five to the left, uh, to the right, I should say, and then we rise seven. So our vertex is at five comma seven. One, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right here. The stretch factor of four thirds says we rise four, run three in both directions. It'll be off the map or off the thing. I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three. Up four and left three as well, like that. Best I can do with the kind of the graph axes I gave. You know, I'm really harking on the book every so often when it comes to the graphs that they provided because they scale by twos every so often. You might say, well, you know, Mr. Robinson, this is a good time to scale by twos. It really is. And I somewhat agree. The problem is when they give us some odd numbers and we have to be in between points and stuff. I'm not the biggest fan of that. So, you know, I do what I can. And as long as you're okay with going a little off the graph, hey, I am too. <laughs> Integrated math too. Okay, the domain. Hey, it is all real numbers once again, guys. This is something, we, it is going left and right forever. The range is limited, however, because we have an absolute minimum at y equals 7. And it only goes up from there. So the y values are greater than or equal to seven. If you've seen a lot of domain and range from kind of our last module of things, I, I hope it's kind of making sense on how those work now. Okay, number eight. G of x equals negative seven six times the absolute value of x minus two. Once again, parentheses that don't really matter. I guess that happened here as well. There isn't a k value that I see that will mean it's plus zero. So where's our vertex? Right two and up or down none so just write two remember oh, it's a minus is a plus you know, flip so write two and then don't go up or down at all plot the point right there i hope you can see the kind of lighter blue negative seven six this time we do go down it is an upside down facing v the vertex is an absolute maximum as we will go down seven and left and right six all right so we'll go down seven and right six and down seven and left six. Really all I can fit. These graphs should be symmetrical. Oh, I don't know if I actually have that blue in line form. Just, ugh. I'm not gonna say just go with it here. I'll just get close. Well, that's okay. 
I must have cre I must have customized that blue fry marker at some different point in time that doesn't really show with that. Oh well. Okay, there's that one there, but they do want our domain and range. I'm gonna have to get a darker blue to write that. I don't want it to get unseen. Hey, all real numbers, right? All real number domain go left and right forever. Again, I don't see a time that we're gonna be limited there for absolute value functions. Unless they're drawn to show that there are limitations. The range, this time we go downward, right? Now our highest y value we hit is zero on the x-axis, it's the highest y value, and it goes down from there. So this time y is less than or equal to zero because it does touch zero. It's also gonna include equal to the vertex point. All right, three more questions, guys. I will have some room on these ones to write down below. Uh, g of x equals three fourths, or the absolute value of three fourths times x minus two, the quantity x minus two minus seven. Again, if you pull out that three fourths from it, it's just going to stay as a positive three fourths. It multiple, you know, it's the a value. The a is three fourths, and x minus two. We're seeing a lot of x minus twos, man. Uh, x minus two. We're going to go right two as we flip, and then we keep. We're going to go down seven. So our vertex is right to down Kevin right there. That is the vertex. All right. Rise three, run four, both directions. Up three over four, up three over four. One more time, up three over, yeah, over four, and up three over four. I can keep going to this one, up three over four like that. All right. Once again, the symmetry is there. You just gotta make sure that you understand the window range is limited on the right side, not so much on the left side there, but I do go up, and that can help us with our domain range stuff. Our domain, of course, is all real numbers here. But that range, our lowest y value we hit is negative seven. The k value does, you know, as the vertex, it is the absolute max or min, so you know you are bound by k, but the question is do you go above or below? In this case, we go above, based on a being positive. y is greater than or equal to negative seven. There's our domain range. Two more. Looking good, oh man, I am going a little long. I feel like my description is overly done, but you know what, are you learning something? I sure hope so. Uh, factor the five sevenths out, take its absolute value, it still becomes five sevenths. Your k value is non-existent. Let's see if I can go without writing those and see if you can understand it. That means there's no translation up or down. It's only to the right, we only translate to the right. We are going to go right four units for our vertex, one, two, three, four units, and not go up or down at all as far as vertex translation goes. Rise five, run seven, here we go, one, two, three, four, five, and then seven, four plus seven is 10, 11 over there. Four minus seven is negative three right there. I can fit another one, two, three, four, five, and then all the way to negative 10 right there. Yes, I don't know if that counts as fitting it, but I am going to plot it because I can. All right, there's the graph. Our domain, folks, is once again, all real numbers. We go right and left forever, and the range, our smallest value is zero, and we stay above it as they're all positive. Y is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, last one. Um, this time I, I am gonna pull out the negative 7 thirds in the way I've mentioned the factoring before, so check this out. Remember, the absolute value of a product is the product of two absolute values. Take the absolute value of negative 7 thirds, multiply it by the absolute value of x plus 5. The minus 4 is right there. So that is a rewrite of this in, you know, different form there. Now I take the absolute value of the negative 7 thirds, and this will become a positive 7 thirds right here. So this goes from its negative form to its positive form. And yes, that does mean that this graph is not going downward. In fact, it is going upward. So don't just look at that negative inside the absolute value and say, hey, we're good, we're good. Nope, you gotta get it in its proper vertex form to reveal what it is in order to realize it. Same thing with this plus five, guys. Remember, we flip this one. Uh, plus five means we're going left five as far as the vertex goes. I'll just draw this one in black. Uh, left five and down four. So one, two, three, four, five, and down one, two, three, four. But this is saying you're going upward. We are going upward. Up seven, left and right three. So up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and right three, and up seven, left three. There we go. And this is the first time I think I can fit one again to the right side, but not actually to the left side there. If I wanted to kind of squeeze it in, I could be about right there. All right, so there's my symmetry. Here comes Z graph. Arrows, please. 
please, so that the domain really makes sense with what we're talking about. Is that, is that symmetrical? I guess I could bend it a little bit more. All right, the domain here, all real numbers, and the range greater than or equal, y is greater than or equal to negative four. Let me see the equation with it. The range y is greater than or equal to negative four. There's the domain range, there's that equation, and I am done. That is what these things look like, guys. Bunch of V-shapes, they don't really change with that. Don't take my word for it. Try and plug them into tables and see if you get the exact same points, but that's the shorthand notation, as all these graphs do have shorthand notations. Once you see things that I do later with rational functions, with quadratics and things, depending on which kind of material you're looking at, you are gonna see the A, H, and K, and see how I use them in really the same way regarding translations and stretch factors, just with the behavior of their functions being different. That ought to do it for this one, guys. This is Mr. Robinson. Thank you so much for watching, and see you in the next one. Take care.